This is a timeline of events on the 7th of August 1985 at White House Farm. The evidence in the sequence supports Jeremy Bamber's innocence and all of the information is taken from police logs, statements and other police material. Jeremy Bamber took a break from work and went into the farmhouse where his parents Neville and June Bamber and his sister Sheila Caffell were eating a meal. They were discussing the help what Sheila needed with the children. The possibility of foster care for the boys was a central theme. Jeremy returned to work harvesting the rapeseed on the farm. He later went back to the farmhouse a couple more times during the course of the evening where the conversation regarding Sheila and the children was still ongoing. On one of these breaks Jeremy had seen some rabbits close to the house and had taken the .22 rifle out from its place in the scullery and loaded ammunition but the rabbits had scattered and he didn't fire the gun. Jeremy finished work and drove his silver Astra to his cottage at Head Street Gold Hangar, about three miles away from the farm. Barbara Wilson, the farm secretary, telephoned Neville at home and recalled he was short with her on the telephone, leaving her feeling that she had interrupted an argument. Neville Bamber was seen collecting the last load of rapeseed. Pamela Blowflower, June's sister, telephoned the farm and spoke to Sheila for approximately two minutes. She later described Sheila as being zombie-like and only giving yes and no answers. Pamela also spoke to June, who said that Sheila was going to bed and they went on to discuss Sheila's health. June was worried that Sheila had been acting oddly. Meanwhile at Head Street, Jeremy made his usual evening telephone call to his girlfriend Julie Mugford, who was drinking alcohol and smoking marijuana. Julie made little sense during this conversation, and after a few minutes, Jeremy ended the call. After relaxing by watching some television, Jeremy went to bed. Jeremy was woken by a telephone call from his father who said come over quickly and that Sheila had gone crazy and had the gun. The line then went dead. Jeremy then tried to call his dad back but repeatedly got the engaged tone. CC West telephoned Malcolm Bonnet on the internal police line to relay information regarding a telephone call from Neville Bamba. Neville stated that his daughter, Sheila Bamber, aged 26, had gone berserk and had hold of one of his guns. Jeremy telephoned his girlfriend, Julie Mugford, and told her there was something wrong at the farm. Unconcerned, she advised Jeremy to go back to bed. Bonnet contacted PC Saxby at Witham Station over the police radio, who along with PC Mile and PS Booz were instructed to attend the scene. Following the radio message from Malcolm Bonnet recorded on his log that car CA7 containing Booz, Saxby and Mile had been instructed to attend. A second car was dispatched to the scene containing PC Nordcup and Cracknell, who had been in the control room with PC West when he received Neville Bamber's call. Concerned that he could not get his father back on the phone, Jeremy made a telephone call to the police and also spoke to PC West, informing him that his father had rang and said that his sister had gone crazy and had hold of the gun. PC West spoke on the internal police telephone line to PC Saxby, who was preparing to leave Witham Police Station following the instruction for Malcolm Bonnet to attend the reported incident. PC Mile recalled that Jeremy Bamber was still on the other phone line to PC West while 
P.C. West was speaking to Saxby. P.C. West asked Jeremy if he could meet the officers at the farm and Jeremy agreed. P.C. West attempted to call White House Farm but found that the line was engaged as Jeremy had stated and that it had been when he had tried to call Neville back. Jeremy left his cottage and set off in his car towards White House Farm. B.C. West, who was in the control room, contacted British Telecom and spoke to their operative, Jean Rowe, to check the telephone line at White House Farm. Jean Rowe informed West that the line was actually off the hook. En route to White House Farm, Jeremy was passed by the police car with the blue flashing lights, which contained PC Saxby, Mile and PS Buse. Car CA7 arrived at Pages Lane, parking at the entrance of the lane to await the arrival of Jeremy. Jeremy Bamber arrived at the lane in his silver Astra. He spoke to the police officers and after a brief discussion, they all drove closer to the farm. It is also at this time a log is attributed to having been written at the scene by PC Batchelor. Although he did not arrive at the scene until 4.25 a.m. The police and attendants decided to undertake a recce of the farmhouse which P.S. Buse and P.C. Mile completed, accompanied by Jeremy. During this recce, P.C. Mile saw movement in the bedroom window and alerted Buse and Jeremy, who both saw the movement too. The trio all initially ducked down behind a hedge before running back to the safety of the waiting police car on Pages Lane. On reaching the security of the police vehicle, P.S. Buse immediately radioed through a situation report to police headquarters information room and requested firearms assistance. The situation report made by P.S. Buse regarding the movement seen in the window has never been disclosed to the defence. Members of the firearms unit were stood down from the duties they were conducting at the time and instructed to prepare to draw firearms in relation to a shooting incident at White House Farm. P.S. Buse conducted two more cautious recce's of the house and upon seeing no further movement reported that there were no signs of life in the house and also that all lights were on. Authority was given for the police to collect firearms and to attend the scene by CSI Harris. The decision was endorsed by Assistant Chief Constable Mr Simpson. PCs Norcup and Cracknell in car CA5 eventually arrived at the scene. Seemingly they had not rushed and the 17 mile journey, which should have taken 35 minutes maximum within the speed limits, had taken them 45 minutes. Car CA6 was also requested to attend this time. Car CA6 arrived containing officers PC Lay and PC Bachelor. Owing to their promptness to arrive, it can only be assumed the officers were on the way to the scene prior to being formally requested just one minute prior to arrival. Car CA6 with PC's Bachelor and Lay left the scene to meet with firearms units in Tiptree to escort them to the farm. Car CA6 had now met the firearms team was heading back to the farm, acting as escort. Two police transit vehicles arrived at the scene, containing nine firearms officers and vehicle QZ50, also arrived containing PC Mercer and the dog unit. 
the firearms officers took up positions with guns drawn to cover the house within moments of arrival. PC Mile was instructed to keep Jeremy away from the house at a distance of at least 400 yards. The firearms team are recorded as being in conversation with someone from within. Jeremy was asked what they could say to Sheila to engage her in conversation. The conversation had now ceased and there was no response from the person within the house to the challenges made by the police by the loud hailer. Jeremy was asked if the police could contact anyone for him to talk to. He said he would like to telephone his girlfriend, Julie Mugford, and PC Lay drove him to a public phone box so he could call her. The open telephone line in the house was checked again and the phone reported to have been engaged. This contradicts the information received from the BT operator at 3.42am who stated that the phone was off the hook. Different tones indicated the different state of the phone. Jeremy returned to the scene with police after making his phone call to Julie and waited in a police car on Padges Lane. PC Mile starts a log known as Log 12. This has been disclosed, but it is inaccurately attributed to BC Saxby. Mile told the Dickinson investigation that he drove a car, CA7, into the farmyard and began Log 12. The line to the farm was now being continually monitored. BT had been monitoring the open phone line since 5.50am. Essex police claim that they intercepted the open 999 phone line to listen, but the BT operator, Jean Rowe, said this was not possible because she was not permitted to engage the emergency line. Therefore, unless a 999 emergency call was made from the house, the only way the line could be connected was via a normal police telephone line. Police car CG32 arrived containing two more officers, PC Chaplin and WPC Dixon, from Witham Police Station. A request was made for two ambulances to attend the scene, one for immediate use and one for standby purposes. Essex Police and the firearms team did not explain what changed, prompting them to make this request for ambulances. Neither did they explain why ambulances had not been requested earlier in the morning. Ten more firearms officers, including Inspector Montgomery, arrive at the scene in two police transit vehicles, call signs QK23 and QK24. Chief Inspector Clark arrived at the farm with his driver. The lights in the main bedroom window, previously reported as being turned on, were now turned off and the curtains in the room were now closed. Two ambulances arrived at the scene with four crew members. Car CA2 with Chief Superintendent Harris and his driver arrived at the scene. Car CG-10, containing Chief Inspector Gibbons and PC Panting, arrived at White House Farm. The light was now back on and the curtains were fully open in the main bedroom. Police vehicles were by now increasing in numbers, with more arriving at the scene every few minutes. Two FSU officers reported that they had seen a rifle in the window of a room adjacent to the master bedroom. One of these was firearms officer and inspector Julia Japes, now a counsellor working in Chelmsford. When asked about her sighting of a gun, which was later brushed off as a vacuum cleaner nozzle, she said, In relation to your request, I am not prepared to respond to your request for information. 
The case has been subject to numerous reviews and appeals. These have been studied in detail and events and actions that took place. I have nothing to add. It was decided to gain entry to the house using stealth tactics. Remarkably, these stealth tactics consisted of smashing down the back door using a sledgehammer. PC Collins went past the back door together with PC Delgado and looked into the kitchen via a window to the right of the door and initially reported that he could see the body of who he thought was a woman in the kitchen. PC Collins then returned to the door and reported the key was in the lock on the inside of the door. Upon gaining entry to the kitchen, the raid team reported that one dead male, one dead female were found on entry of premises, and this was duly recorded both on the police logs and on a police communication log written by Inspector Norman. The raid team then proceeded to search the remainder of the ground floor. PC Hall, raid team member, gave evidence. I immediately heard a noise upstairs and began to challenge up the stairs I was covering. I was calling to Sheila Bamba to make her whereabouts known to me. A coroner's officer, PC Wright, was informed of fatalities and was requested to attend. The order was given to stop recording and monitoring the open telephone line. A request was made for a doctor to examine two bodies and not five, suggesting that two were found downstairs and three upstairs, and not as the police would have us to believe, one downstairs and four upstairs. Inspector Montgomery advised that no further firearms personnel were required at the scene. The upper floor had now been searched and it was recorded that three further bodies had been discovered. The raid team wore open microphones, yet none of the recordings have ever been disclosed to the defence, perhaps because the true sequence of events would have been revealed, perhaps the sound of Sheila moving from the kitchen to the bedroom. Assistant Chief Constable Simpson requested to speak to DCI Harris over a landline. DCI Harris called him using the kitchen telephone from within the farm, later denied at the 2002 appeal of Jeremy Bamba. Police surgeon Dr Craig arrived at the scene to confirm the deaths. DCI Jones and DI Miller are requested to go to the scene. The decision was made not to tell the press anything and that a formal press conference would be held later in the morning. PC Chaplin starts keeping two logs. One of these is recording who went in and out the back door at White House Farm. This is separate to the log noted at 4am in relation to Saxby. PC Shoulders keeps a log at the front door of the house recording who enters and leaves. Neither log has ever been disclosed. Dr Craig, CSI Harris, PC Wright, the coroner's officer, and D.I. Gibbons all state that Sheila had a single gunshot wound and not two as it, as it shows in the crime scene photographs. P.C. Watson and P.C. Cummings attend the scene in car CA-4. The reason for their presence is unknown. No witness statements were ever made by them. Dr. Craig saw Jeremy and offered him whiskey, which he accepted. D.I. Cook and D.C. Bird arrive in car CP-03. Shortly after, Jeremy was driven home to Head Street in his own car by the police. Six further firearms officers arrived at the scene. Essex police stated that they were called in to keep the press at bay. However, informatives or training exercise were noted in the radio logs. No scenes of crimes officers were allowed in the house for a period of 45 minutes after they arrived at 9.16am until 10am. DS Jones and DC Clark of CID arrive. Further CID officers, DC Henderson, DI Miller, DS Jones 
and D.S. Davidson arrived at the scene. Essex police maintain it was D.C. Hammersley and not D.C. Henderson who attended. D.I. Miller describes Sheila as having been found with the rifle by her right side and not with the rifle lengthways across her body as it is seen in crime scene photographs taken after 10am. Chaplin ceases keeping his record stating, I was instructed by someone, don't know who, to stop recording who was entering the house as officers were by then using two entrances and it was impossible for me to record correctly who was coming and going. The lists kept up to date to this time of those who entered the house have not been disclosed. Police photographer began to take crime scene photographs. He requests the gun resting on Sheila to be made safe. Seven crime scene photographs show Sheila's body with her hand and the gun in different positions. In one, the gun is on Sheila's body, but another, taken just minutes later, as the photographer moved down the stairs, show the gun resting in the window when it, was, when it should still have been on Sheila's body until 11.10am, according to D.I. Cook. P.C. Bird, the photographer, had completed taking the photographs of the interior of the scene and the bodies were placed into bags in readiness for the removal from the scene. The gun was removed from Sheila's body, supposedly, for the first time. P.C. Chaplin's second log finishes. The log added to by the relief radio officer from 5.42am comes to an end. P.C. Shoulders takes over the log at the scene, but the radio operator, up until 1550, P.C. Milbank, never made a statement for Jeremy's trial. It was simply assumed that Malcolm Bonnet monitored the radio throughout the incident. He did not inform the jury that he went off duty at 5.40am that morning. <laughs>